On today's episode of The Glue Guys, we will celebrate the Nets first round demolition of the Boston Celtics that is crumbling right now as we speak. And we're going to talk to Bilga Abiri from New York Magazine and Vulture.com, the film critic for those establishments. We did a special killer comparison, revenge movies to Nets playoff opponents. Welcome back to the Glue Guys. This is Mike here. Say hello, Brian. Hello. Check us out on Twitter at BKGlueGuys, NetsDaily.com, The Athletic. Get yourself behind that paywall. Go to TheAthletic.com slash Glue Guys. Brian. Michael, it's the end of an era. It's the end of a the long, Nets are back. it's a long haul from beginning to end. We we talked about this on the interview that we have that's coming up here with Bilgo. We spoiler alert, it's already been recorded. But, you know, we did begin this podcast the eve of the Pierce Garnett trade. Literally that night I called up Mike after you know, how many years of not of, of not speaking of not being on speaking terms with one another. But basically, <laughs> and we we're like now's the time. You know, the bad signal was in the sky and we knew what we had to do. <laughs> And, you know, we we were full of, of piss and vinegar, and we thought we had the championship contending team. Yeah. Spoiler alert, that that didn't happen. Um, but, you know, here we are, not so many moons later, full circle. How does it feel, Mike? How is, does it feel like a like you, like closure a little bit for you? It's even better than closure, right? It's better because it's revenge, wow. as we will wow. talk about. Wow. Uh, it's revenge. I mean, it, it is truly to retrace those years. Right. The trade happens. It's almost universally um, accepted. The Nets got the better end of the deal. They got Kevin Garnett and Paul Pierce to add to Brooke Lopez and Darren Williams. That is uh, a a team that is impossible to beat. Jason Kidd was coach. Jason Kidd and all those players were on the cover of Sports Illustrated. It was an exciting time. And there were the Celtics. And at that time, we didn't value pick swaps we didn't really think about pick swaps in that way no joe johnson was on the team too wow um and and and, but yet all those years the nets had one good year and then they sucked uh the celtics quickly rebuilt their team they used those draft picks every lottery night they the there is someone from espn would have to say the celtics are here early up high up in the lottery because Mm-hmm. Of the Kevin Garnett, Paul Pierce trade, mm-hmm. and and so, um, in all these years, it's not even death by a thousand cuts; it is um, death by a thousand tweets, Brian. Because we would have to suffer people talking about the the next dynasty in, with the Celtics, and at one point it seemed like the Celtics were going to have Kyrie Irving and Anthony Davis leading the team. That the Celtics were going to get Anthony Davis, and they'd be off and on their way, and the Nets would suck forever. Well, how do you like me now, Brian? How do you like mm. them apples? How do you like them apples, Mike? That's right. As Cole Buckley might say, how do you like them apples? <laughs> old Cole. Yeah. Old 21-year-old Cole. <laughs> looking so innocent and dumb. Yeah. He's the, he's the Morgan of the of the crew. You can tell. He's Morgan. <laughs> um, it's really, it really is. Like, as, as sort of like lackluster, like, you know, the energy in the building – for parts of game five wasn't that amped up energy on the floor wasn't as amped up and i understand it because the nets were going against not kemba walker and robert williams and and jalen brown they were going against romeo langford yeah and peyton pritchard it was of the kind Jason of Tatum. it were too dignified as a franchise to get all worked up over a situation <laughs> like this you know this is like we just had to you know quietly place the pillow over their heads and send them to the to the nether realm quietly you know it didn't have to be a whole big thing that's how i feel um there was something to like the fact that the Nets have like I mean, the Nets dominated both games four and five, and that is obvious and clear. I guess there's slight concern that they didn't dominate enough. I guess you could be concerned about that a little bit. And we'll get to all that. You know, our next episode is going to be the big yeah. Bucks Nets preview. We're going to dive into that because I mean that series. I am 
both excited for and terrified of? This is the series. Like, I, I mean, this is the one right here, boys. We're going into the Eastern Conference Finals, you know, early this year. Um, it, lots to it, take, lots, lots to take note of. Lots to analyze there, Mike. But we wanted to celebrate. Yeah, I mean, this it, is this it, is just you a can't dancing. Celebrate and, the victories. Yeah. Yeah, because because what has now happened, and obviously, if people are listening to this, they now know. In my wildest dreams, you know, so we did some, we did a segment before this series of like most excited outcome, right? Of what, what do we want to see from the series? How much humiliation could the Nets pile on top of the Boston Celtics? Never in my wildest dreams did I think that would really involve Danny Ainge leaving the organization though i think i did say that was part of my dream um but but also Kyrie stomping on a part of a floor and this boston sports media mafia flipping out as if he burned an american flag yeah um, you would have thought he pulled down his pants and scooted across lucky's face with his with his bare butt cheeks with the with the reaction that we got <laughs> you know it was and it, it made me feel – so we talked about old Cole Buckley. People don't know who Cole oh, Buckley is. Cole Buckley. He's going to be an instant legend, I can feel, of the podcast. True boy, Cole Buckley. True he, boy. He might be I a recurring message. character. He might call in someday. Yeah. yeah. Old Cole um, Old Cole Buckley is a 21-year-old who threw a water bottle. I mean, it's so insane. And he's, and he's so, whacking off into his into my mother's – wait, what is he? <laughs> he's whacking off into a mitt, a baseball mitt? <laughs> Wait, what's that from? It's Morgan. That he's, Morgan. It's a good, good old hunting one. Yeah. And Morgan's using the baseball mitt. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> that's, cool. Um, yeah. that's cool. Um, it, and so think about the insanity of that. And we've seen some things happen in, you know, there's a fan at the Wizards game who ran onto the court. There was the Knicks fan who spit on Trey Young. And a white, a know, real white Flemmy like wad too. That I you saw it like in midair, like like a discus. It was so gross. I hate I hate spit. Everyone knows it, but if you know me for five minutes, you know I don't like spit. And that was really gross. And and Knicks fans' favorite thing to do is to make themselves feel superior. They will they will bag on the Nets fan base and like, oh wow, look how many more fans the Knicks have. Oh look how much more excited the Garden is. And the Garden was has been electric though. It's Wednesday. We'll see if they win. They win their game five. Um, I, you know, I, I remember the the whole like debate of like, wow, the Knicks are dominating New York. Well, if they don't make it to the second round of the playoffs, and I'm not like too worried. You know, like that's cool. You guys got believe. so. Anyways, it's not that cool. I, you got I, one one win <laughs> in. If if they lose tonight, they'll have won one game of their first round series as the higher seed. It's not good. That's not a good situation. I am comforted by the fact that the Nets fan base, I'm sure there are some bad apples, Brian. There's bad apples everywhere. We vet them but closely. That's my this, feeling. We vet them closely. This, yeah. this fan base has been nurtured like like a, a beautiful garden. has been raked, and the seeds have been planted. We're not just letting wild plants grow. No. no. Wild. No spitters. No. no spitters in our no, – No. Yeah. It, it's a respectful fan base. It's an engaged fan base. The Brooklyn Br- Gr- Brigade, uh, they, they chant funny things, not hurtful things. I People people really gave a pass on the Trey is, is balding thing. People were like, that's funny. I like, I don't know. That's not that clever. It's a little well, bit – it's fine. I, I, mean, I, I'm I not like, like attacking a, a hairline. You know <laughs> I, mean? I know because it's like – I don't get that actually, what, what that fixation is for you. But, I mean, attacking the hairline. You know, I've it's never, a personal thing. I've never seen you attack thing. it. I've seen you observe, note on it, Analyze. like obsessively. But maybe yeah. not. <laughs> maybe not. Atta- I don't attack a hairline. Yeah. No. I just no. think I'm like, but, you know, how many how many guys with receding hairlines in that crowd are are shouting Trey is balling? <laughs> I mean, there's got to be tens of <laughs> ten thousand of them. Yeah. Um. So I I just do appreciate how, like how manage the the Nets fan base is in moments. I'm trying to account for maybe why the crowd wasn't as crazy, but it, you, how could you get hyped up again, though? It, it is so damn exciting that the Nets and Kyrie Irving literally murdered the Celtics franchise. Literally. Literally. Air of Easttown Season 2 is going to be in Worcester, Mass. Yeah. And she's going to be digging through uh, the Celtics franchise and being like, who who murdered who murdered the Celtics? 
Yeah. That's my that's my Philly accent. Yeah. Thank you. Murder. Pretty good. Thank you. Um Wooder. Before we get to our interview with Bilga Abiri from New York Magazine and Vulture, we talk about a lot of fun stuff in that. Let's just do this one big thing, okay? Okay. How do you feel differently from the beginning of the Celtics series towards the end in terms of the projection of this team? Did anything happen in that series sort of shake your foundational understanding and expectations of what the team is. Cause I'll start cause I didn't prepare you for this. I, so I mean, I'm, I got something if you want. Okay, go for it. Well, yeah, I, th- go for it. I thought there was a couple moments in there. I mean, in the, in the one game that we lost, I felt like we lost it in a very um, like correctable way. I will say that. And that that's when like, there's a that's little a bit point. of twinge of doubt in my mind about Steve Nash's ability to see problems and fix them live and in real time that was that was a, a thought that occurred to me obviously he's he's a first year coach and that's that's all part of the process but from the layman perspective just a couple of a couple of guys hanging out on the discord shout out to the discord and hanging out on the twitch shout out to the twitch um you know watching the game it's like pretty obvious that like jason tatum is looking for Kyrie irving in that high screen switch immediately and he was getting really hot and he just wants to shoot over people our defensive strategy wasn't really adapting for that. And I think until they put Joe Harris on him weirdly, in which they had he had enough size and height, like it was kind of the perfect match. Because basically we kept switching off on KD, Nick Claxton towards the end, Kyrie, all of them trying to kind of find a unique defender for him instead of just matching up like the most similar sized guy who was like an adequate defender, which I think ultimately was, was Joe Harris, which was a good fit. But it took like basically losing the game to figure that out. Um, and that was suboptimal. Um, also, on the other side of the floor, we have a tendency to go iso ball without James Harden in in the lineup, which is an f- amazing, hilarious thing to be saying at you know based on James Harden's iso ball reputation at this point. But literally, the entire team goes into stagnation mode without him uh, facilitating. So it's a habit that I think we can like fall into. Weirdly, it feels like a it's a habit that like KD kind of. It's a thing that you want to feed into a little bit because him hunting for mismatches is a big part of our macro strategy. But if it's not falling, it takes us a long time to like adapt to like, okay, Katie's shot's not going in for this period of time. How do we make this like worthwhile while he's still on the floor? Because those are Katie's minutes. We gotta we gotta be, you know, hitting the hitting the accelerator whenever he's on the floor. So those are the two big sort of things that kind of came to mind, Mike. Yeah, I I mean it's a weird thing to be like the Nets one in five, and yet there are we're perfectionists. I don't know I'm saying you know, we're perfectionists. more concerns, yeah. but like I do, I I'll say it. I think there are like almost more concerns about the team defensively than I had going in. Like going in, I was poo pooing the fact that the Nets weren't that being that it was being said that the Nets weren't good defensively, because I had seen the Nets amp up their defense, and in fact, in games one and two of the series. The Nets held the Celtics to 93 points and then 108 points. The 108 points was the game where the Nets were up by like 40, basically, in the fourth quarter, and they were just coasting at the end. Uh, And in those games, Kemba Walker was playing and and Robert Williams was playing. So, like, those games against the better competition, the better talent, um, the Nets had better, if not uh, pretty good, defense. The, the concern is, for me, and it will continue to be a concern, is that there's just too much of, like, the Nets um, staying in front of people but not pressuring people on defense. Um, they don't really force tough shots at long stretches of the game. They're basically kind of hoping – they're like, eh, the guy's kind of far away from the basket. I'm sure he'll miss. And then he probably doesn't miss because they're NBA players. Um so there's that element. So I'm a little concerned defensively. But here's here's the thing I'll hold it on to. All year long, as the Nets have had Harden not in the lineup, then in the lineup, then not in the lineup, then in the lineup. Kyrie in and out, going on his sabbaticals and coming back. Kevin Durant, COVID protocol, plays, hurt, plays, hurt, plays, right? Like as, as jumbled as they've been, the Nets have been really, really good against the best teams in the NBA. The Nets have been... I don't know this for sure, but I think they have a way better record than the Bucs against the best teams in the NBA than the Bucs do. And the Celtics, I think there's a level of arrogance with the Nets, which the the big three have, 
which is completely warranted. But they have a level of arrogance where they're like, Kyrie and KD are like, we've won championships or a championship in Kyrie's case. Uh, Harden, while doesn't have that in his bag, he's like, I'm, what was he, two-time MVP or MVP once or whatever it was. Um, they have a level of arrogance, and I'm sure they were looking at Romeo Langford and Peyton Pritchard and thinking like, eh, it's playoff basketball, I know, but I, how can I get so engaged, right? Mm. Like, how could they be so fired up to play? And they still beat in games four and five. They won by 15 points and was scored 141 of the game. And in game five, the clinching game, even as as like, oh my, I thought they were about to give up the game at the end. The the Nets still won by 14. So yeah. it's like, I, I think the Nets have shown that when they're fully engaged and they're going to be against the Milwaukee Bucks, that they're unstoppable and they do play defense. So yeah. I hope to see. <clears throat> One other thing that I'll say is like a, Maybe, I don't know if this is sort of setting up any analysis for next week or next show, I mean. Um, but I will say that, like, Jason Tatum is a lot better than I than I was giving him credit for. To be, I kind of underrated him, to be honest. Like, he hits really difficult shots all the time. Um, I, and the way that he does it is actually, like, I think uniquely suited to kind of whoop on the nets a little bit. Um, mostly because, I mean, those are, like, just generally indefensible shots. Um or undefendable, or I don't know. But um, I was thinking about them as like as a comparison for like Giannis, who doesn't play that way at all, and it made me actually a little bit more hopeful for that matchup <laughs> because like Giannis is uh, d- like doesn't have that like sort of range and you know ability to hit like falling tilting three pointers all over the goddamn place. Um, so it, I was like, at least we don't have to deal with that. That that makes me feel a little bit better about that matchup. Um, I'm, and I'm wondering. It's still DeAndre Jordan. I was I, I was wondering if he was ever going to get yes. those minutes against Tristan Thompson, who was pogo stick rebounding our our butts off. Never never saw any floor time. Is is that going to be the meme going forward, Mike? It's an interesting thought. Well, the, the Nets did have the Nets had DeAndre guarding Giannis in a couple of those games, and so. Is it that Nash was like, DeAndre, I know I don't need you for the Celtics series, but I may need you for the Bucks. So don't even think about playing for the Celt- against the Celtics. Like, you can mentally prepare not to play, but I will utilize you in this Bucks series. Or is it that DeAndre Jordan's completely out of the road, like just gone? Yeah. He is untethered. He is in space. Possibly. He is, George- what is it, George Clooney and yes. Sandra Bullock? Sun- like, yeah. is he- gravity. Is he just yeah. gravity? Except there is no gravity in that movie. Did you know that? Um, Not to the very end when she lands. Spo- <laughs> spoiler, sorry. Spoiler. Um, yeah, so, you know, it, DeAndre Jordan just may just be gone, gone, but he he should have a role against the Bucks, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk we'll more see. about we'll that. See. One other small sort of note to, to sort of talk about with the Celtics series is that, you know, we got so few minutes with the big three where they actually played together, mm-hmm. and you, you touched on how it's one on at times it gets into ISO, whatever. Though with those three guys, if any of them are going ISO, they're, it's probably going to work out, right? Like they yeah. are the th- three of the best ISO guys in the league. Um, I still think the Celtics weren't good, but it still showed you that the meme that the the Nets lineup is like is just like th- three little satellites going by themselves. You know that they're all separate. There's no flow is wrong like these guys have always shown that when they're on the floor together or if it's just two of them they play within they play off of each other in a way that i think a lot of people assume that they don't Mm. and so you can't just put up 141 points uh by like just being really good at one-on-one basketball right like there's some team flow yes so i I mean this this buck series is going to be so damn exciting it's going to be terrifying but exciting it was i mean and just to add one little last bit on that yes. like at the end of that last <clears throat> game game five we began to see the nick claxton lobs we began to see yes. some more bruce brown pick and roll like it felt like it was coming back online a little bit like i felt like at, to your point like we we definitely didn't respect the celtics thought like eh, maybe this will be a good time to get just get kd into like you know kd mode and just like rip some some mid-rangers over romeo langford or whoever uh, or Grant Williams, who was having a, himself a series. He really made a name for himself out there. He did, actually. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, yeah, so and I'm wondering if, like, by game five, like, okay, guys, like, time to actually, you know, pl- plan to do a little bit more of what we're going to do next series in in this game, maybe. I don't know. It's a thought. 
Yeah, I, I was always kind of like, what? why are they not doing the pick and roll lobs with Nick Claxton as much? And Nick Claxton's minutes in the Celtics series is always, it was just very strange that he wasn't getting more minutes, but it did kind of grow as the series went along. Mm -hmm. They're going to need, I mean, as much as I love Blake Griffin, he really had a bad series for the most part against yeah. the Celtics. And it makes me doubt how effective he'll be against Brooke Lopez, Giannis, on all those guys. Yeah. You know, I'd previously thought that Blake was going to be important, but now I, and Jeff Green, Jeff Green needs to come back from injury. He was not wearing the boot um, while he was on the sidelines for this game. So, Well, Blake we'll Griffin see. seems to not be wanting to take long range shots anymore which is an interesting development or at least not as many of them so like he's not in that venn diagram of what he and jeff green do like that part of it's getting a little bit more further apart it's a little little distance which is not great that's that you know part of having him out there is because it's everyone's a floor spacer in that first lineup um yeah that's not working that's not great yeah but there's so much to dissect so much let's not out. let's not get in the woods this is I a celebration mike we're popping bottles today <laughs> uh first the first game at least as basketball reference has it. Uh, game one, Bucks, Nets is Saturday night, seven thirty p.m. Uh, that is tasty and exciting, and can't wait to watch it. But for your enjoyment, uh, coming up after the break, we have Bilga Abiri from New York Magazine and Vulture. He is a film critic. He's also a Nets fan. Uh, we compare killer comparison uh, NBA teams in the path that the Nets could face in the playoffs to revenge movies uh super fun and there's some good stuff in there so catch you next time dude all right welcome back to the show and joining us now is bilga urbiri who is the film critic for new york magazine and vulture uh bilga you're w one of the most prominent nets fans on twitter um you, I mean, we've been Twitter interacting for a while, and we thought of a perfect... We, I've been wanting to have you on the show for about a few months now. we figured out the perfect segment to have you on. But first, welcome to the show. Um, tell people a little bit about yourself. Introduce yourself to the audience if they don't know who you are. Um, well, first of all, thank you for having me. It has been... Uh, I'm not lying when I say it has been a long dream of mine to be on the Glue Guys podcast. <laughs> Come on. Um, I think this was the first Nets podcast I started listening to, uh, and I still listen religiously, so uh, it's kind of cool to be here. Um, too flattered. So too much. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, uh, as far as who I am, uh, I, I mean, for people wondering about my name, it's, it's Turkish, um, but uh, I have, you know, I've been a film critic for, for, for many, many years, and um, my basketball fandom has, has tended to wax and wane. I mean, mm. I was one of those kids who really got into uh basketball because of michael jordan um in you know late 80s early 90s and um and in fact you know my my journey <laughs> to the nets kind of was related to that because uh being a big jordan fan i i hated uh the knicks um and uh you know going to school in in like the the the, the metro area you know that was like you could watch nationally broadcast games which are not that many but uh, then you had to kind of pick between um, the Nets and the Knicks. <laughs> so I was like, all right, well, the Nets are all right. They're not the Knicks. I, I, think, I, I think these guys are pretty good. Um, and then when they moved to Brooklyn, uh, I, you know, I kind of became a, a full-fledged fan and started actually going to games at Barclays and, and stuff like that. There it so, is. Um, you made yeah. the right choice. You made the right choice. <laughs> um, quick question before we get really, truly started. Sure. Best basketball movie. Why is it Hoop Dreams? <laughs> Get, and you know, I'll just question, that. the hardest question. Yeah, <laughs> what is the best basketball movie? Like? Yeah. Well, I love Hoop Dreams. Um, as a, as a, I mean, certainly best basketball documentary and one of the best documentaries of all time. But in, if we're doing like um, narrative uh, basketball, I have a, a soft spot for um, for Blue Chips, mm -hmm, William sure. Friedkin's Blue Chips, which at the time it came out was was not very well liked at all. But I remember just really loving it. Um, and you know my my son uh who's 12 is is just like obsessed with basketball and obsessed with the nets um so so we see basically every basketball movie including uh random basketball movies from the past that like nobody remembers um try but, uh, try me what do we, what do you got <laughs> <laughs> well uh is it uh, is it is um 
Is Thunderstruck the one starring Kevin Durant? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, that one I have not we, seen, but it's I've yeah, seen the, we, the DVD box art. I've with, seen that. I, I've been yeah. uh, I've been also DMing with the screenwriter to Thunderstruck, oh, and yeah, I've been awesome. flirting with bringing. Is him that on. true? Tell me that that's true. <laughs> We, Mike, we Mike, were, Mike's DM game is legendary at this point. It's it's really uh, good. Yeah. Um, yeah, and we're I, at some point we we're gonna have him on, and then he he was like super into the election, meaning like he at anti Trump, and he would like make these really great like anti Trump videos, like relating to movies and stuff like that. And then so we kind of got lost in the weeds a little bit there. We're gonna have him on at some point, and we're gonna awesome. break down Thunderstruck because it's wow. an important film in Nets history at this point. Um, and I think you can only watch it like you have, you have to fly to China to watch it, basically. Is that right at this point? Yeah. yeah. So I'm excited. It was on about Netflix that. for for many years. Um, <laughs> I think I have like a, a bootleg DVD. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I want that? I want that DVD. <laughs> um, I'm gonna close my window really quick. My, you guys keep going. Yeah. So why why we have a special segment, and I think it relates back. This is a perfect moment, and I'm so glad we're doing it now. Is that. The Nets have just defeated the Boston Celtics. And if you're listening to this, Brian and I had a whole sort of preamble leading up into this moment about how uh, and an, what an amazing feeling it is that after all these years, Brian and I have been doing uh, this podcast since the Kevin Garnett, Paul Pierce trade. Yeah, Basically night this, of, like we started it right after, right? The, and the slog, what, mm. a sl- uh, what a slog, a beautiful, terrible slog that it was. Um Sean Kilpatrick and Do- Donald Sloan and and hoping Chris McCullough was the next Kevin Durant himself like you like all the things you kind of trick your mind into as a fan and in literally um the uh the, the Nets got their revenge as a franchise so what we're doing this is a killer comparisons revenge movies to Nets playoff opponents NBA teams okay so it's from a Nets perspective and what I did was I, I gave Bilga and Brian and myself a list of, of revenge movies. And what's classified as a revenge movie sometimes is a little strange. Um, there's some movies on the list you're like, really? But then uh, we kind of try to match them up with the teams in the playoffs. And I think we should start with the Celtics. And I even broke it out. I have one separate one for Danny Age and Sean Marks. But Bilga, why don't you start because you're a guest and we want you to be comfortable <laughs> on the show. Uh, what was your Celtics revenge movie that that felt right to you? Well, to me, it has to be Carrie, um, <laughs> and and I think you were the one who actually first pointed out that Carrie is kind of a revenge movie because uh, mm. I hadn't thought of it in that way. But Carrie kind of works because, well, because you know the Celtics basically their great sin was to humiliate us uh, at a time when we were young and tender and naive and inexperienced (laughs) and didn't really know how the world the world worked Mm. um and you know the celtics and and danny ainge basically kind of took us for a ride uh thinking that (laughs) made made, making us think that they were our friends (laughs) Um, and they were helping that they were helping the nets here here are these two stars pierce and garnett yeah they, they, they were helping uh our young team and our new owner um and in fact, they absolutely humiliated us and spent the last <laughs> however many years laughing at us. I mean, and that's kind of the the main sin. Like, I don't, you know, I, I can't think of like a ton of, aside, obviously the Kyrie stuff of the past couple of years has exacerbated all this. But like before that, I never thought of the Celtics as being like the Nets' mortal enemy in that way. Um, but really this, you know, this, the humiliation mm. um, is very much like, you know the prom scene in in Carrie. You know because that's ultimately what it is. It's just a humiliation, and mm. and you know she goes nuts and rages and burns the place down, <laughs> which I guess is what we sort of did. I and love it's in, a gym, like, in a gymnasium. Mm, yeah, right? true. A gymnasium. True. Lots yeah. of parallels there. Yeah. yeah. The yeah. and and so I mean, there's obviously not. It's not who who's spilling blood on whose head at that point, right? I don't know, but we, we literally, I mean, we were speaking today, Danny Ainge is leaving the Celtics organization and Brad Stevens is no longer the head coach. He's going to be in basketball operations. Like, and we've talked about this before the show. There was a funny fake story that was floating around that it was written as if it was from ESPN where it said sources told ESPN, which again, not true. 
that Danny Ainge was so mad about Kyrie stomping on the Celtic logo that he he said, quote, to the other players in the Celtics, let's go get that bastard and go get him. And you know what? It's Wait, kind of sad. That, that, that's like, a fake news bit, right? You, you tee that up as not yeah. true. Not yeah, true. Not yeah, true. Yeah. Not true. Not yeah. true. Yeah. And the the funny thing is, it was almost it is almost believable, right? Like that's how, the thing. how insane things mm. have gotten. Yeah, I read it and I was like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. This, this makes perfect sense. <laughs> Whoever photoshopped the ESPN stuff, they did a great job. Really, uh, an artist. Um, go ahead. Brian, do you have a revenge movie for Celtics? I do, and I borrowed a lot of what Bilga was saying here. Um, in, in doing also the sort of like rubric for like what would fit here, I thought it was an interesting thing to kind of consider the matrix of revenge films. You know, I just wanted to like tee this part of it up, which is that Beautiful. like there's kind of a matrix there of like the scale of the initial violation versus the <laughs> scale of the response, right? So there's like you can have something that's, you know, really terrible happen to you and then you like very quickly and succinctly get revenge or you can go, you know, the other direction very, you know, long term you know, anyways, there's a whole bunch of different ways to chop that up. And so I was thinking about that with regards to this. And I, I came to the conclusion that I think the Ving Rhames scene in Pulp Fiction where he gets revenge <laughs> on, on um, Zed, I think, Zed's dead, uh, is, is sort of came to mind. Because, like, I was thinking of the Nets as, like, being way late. We were on a journey that was totally not involving Boston. It was like, a, you know, we were on our own hero's path. And then suddenly we are waylaid by years because of this, you know, with these people inserted themselves, you know, into our lives. And then we were in a, in a basement dungeon for, you know, four years. And so, and so now we're finally freed of that. And I thought it was a nice succinct, because like the moments in which he's like, we're going to go medieval on your ass. He like, one, one understands that he brutally but quickly kills Zed. And and moves on uh, with his with his journey, <laughs> and that's that's so. And for those reasons, for that like you know that temporal kind of exchange, and uh, and also you know to to Bilga's point, the humi- the amount of humiliation involved in that was is still it's still you know there in in Ving Rhames, it's it's much more of a private humiliation, but a humiliation on the nonetheless. Um, so anyways, I thought that that was the that was the comp for me. I have so I have two movies in two different levels for this. I, so I said the Celtics was like the Revenant. You know, literally the Nets were left in the wilderness of the NBA. Their future was stolen. Uh, if you haven't seen The the Revenant, I don't know if I can recommend. I mean, Bilga, you, you know better than I. I mean, it's a great movie. Uh, it's a tough, it's a tough slogging watch. And I almost feel like outside the movie theater, it's, it's tougher, right? Like I, you need to be trapped in a room to, to watch the remaining movie because it's a tough, tough movie. Do, all do, do you agree with that, Bilga? Is that where do you stand on The Revenant? Hot takes only. I, I am I am not a Revenant fan. That's that's um, what I like to hear. That's where I stand. I I, yeah. I, I do that that director uh, you know Alejandro Gonzalez Inarritu is 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 you know famously contentious in in film critic and film Twitter circles. There are a lot of oh, people great. who hate him and mm. a lot of people who love him. And um, I'm sort of in the middle in that he's made several films I really love, including Birdman and Amores Peros, and then several films I, I despise, like uh, Babel and um, was it. Uh, 21 grams um mm. and uh and the revenant it, it struck me as a movie i mean i'm not going to go into a whole film criticism thing but <laughs> I but i watched that to. movie <laughs> and, and later on finding out that you know you two like shot that movie and then won the oscar for uh birdman and then edited the movie like that makes perfect sense to me because i'm like there's like a great hundred minute movie in here waiting to get out but yeah it's like the director was like garlanded with Oscars halfway through the <laughs> yeah. production, and like nobody was willing to say no to him afterwards. Yes. Um, but you know, Leo's great. I think Tom Hardy is actually secretly like the best thing about that movie. Mm-hmm. Um, so you know, and it's obvious it is you know absolutely intense uh, production, and everybody in that film, like everybody who worked on that film, clearly is working at the top of their uh, top of their game yeah. in terms of you know stunts, production design, all that. So. I have a lot of admiration for the movie. Not a big fan of the actual movie, right? And and I think so. There's an appreciation for what went into it, but the thing that actually came out of it, you're like, you see it once, and then that's it. You don't need to see it again. (laughs) Um, So the cell. So for me, Revenant. I mean, again, if you haven't seen the movie, the the Nets are Hugh Glass. They're Leo DiCaprio. They're they're left for dead, and Tom Hardy goes on and goes on in his journey after leaving Leo for dead. Tom Hardy is obviously the Celtics. I went another step further, and, and this is a very current movie, so I understand if her audience hasn't watched it yet. But Danny Ainge and Sean Marks, to me, is like Cruella, 
Okay, I just wow. just I did <laughs> wow. the premiere access. I did the oh my twenty nine ninety nine plus tax uh, wow. on Disney Plus to watch Cruella. One way better than I thought it was going to be. Pretty, it's pretty good. Um, yeah. Pretty good. Um, and I don't want to give too much of the plot away, but it's I mean it's Cruella. It's this isn't you know Macbeth, but it. <laughs> Basically, Emma Stone's character is getting revenge in the movie, and you find out why during the movie, but she's getting revenge, um, and she's the young up-and-comer, uh, and she's going against sort of the old power establishment, and Danny Ainge has, you know, he was part of the Celtics teams as a player in the past, uh, he's been with the Celtics for a long time, he's part of the the infrastructure there, and now is no longer, and then Sean Marks is Emma Stone. He's uh, and he has crazy hair, Sean Marks, and so does uh, Emma Stone in the movie. So it works perfectly. And if you haven't seen the movie, you know it's it's not worth thirty dollars, uh, but it, <laughs> there it is. it's it's worth it's worth watching when it becomes available on Disney Plus. Yeah. It's a fun ride. I'll, I'll pick up that Blu-ray at Dollar General when it when it, when it comes out <laughs> for sure. Yeah. Um, let's move on to the 76ers, the Philadelphia 76ers. Um, I'll start here, and then Bill will go to you. Uh, so for the 76ers, I had Rocky IV. Um, Rocky IV is an interesting movie within the revenge movie spectrum. Of course it's a revenge movie. I mean, Apollo Creed is murdered in the ring, and Rocky trains to fight Drago uh, because his friend was murdered in the ring. Uh, so I say it's like the 76ers because that Nets-Sixers matchup in the playoffs in 2019 with D'Lo... Spencer Dinwiddie, Jared Dudley, that whole crew, they were like Apollo Creed. They weren't ready for the fight. They didn't train properly. And in came, you know, this this juggernaut of a talented team in the 76ers and basically dispatched with the Nets pretty quickly. And now the Nets have just been in that snowy cabin, just getting just getting big, injecting HGH, and getting ready to fight the Russians. Um, and the Russians are the 76ers. So the Nets are Rocky. Uh, Rocky Four is the 76ers. Wow. Bill, what do you say? I, I, I like that comparison. I, I hadn't quite thought of it in that way. Um, uh, I am, in this case, perhaps blinded by my uh, hatred of the 76ers, but, <laughs> but I'm going to go with John Wick for this one. Um, <laughs> oh, God. Because, um, th- you know, they... Uh, First of all, I, I I really dislike. I mean, I have a lot of friends who are actually from Philadelphia and are 76ers fans, so I, I should tread carefully, but but I won't. Um, you know, I just I, I hate the 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 culture, the, the 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 tanking culture, and just everything about their team in that way. I think you know, I'm sure Ben Simmons is a is a, is a perfectly nice guy in person, but he just seems Pro- to me probably not. A, yeah, a, yeah. a vaguely <laughs> ridiculous human being, yeah. Right? Yeah. you know, posting you know Instagram stories of him dunking on Tyler Johnson and stuff like that. <laughs> um, so uh, there's just a lot of things about the 76ers that, that just rub me the wrong way, and and they just there's just this like sense of entitlement there that I don't know that that reminds me of the bad guys in John Wick, um, mm. Mm. who you know who kind of don't know who they're messing with uh, when they mess with John Wick. And then also because there's a little bit of history there. Um, I mean, obviously, the uh, the 76ers Nets playoff series that you mentioned, and also that the fight, uh, the big fight, um, and kind of the, the the back and forth between Jared Dudley and Ben Simmons and all that. That sort of is like the 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 central sin, like the, the you know th- that is the killing our dog. <laughs> I guess <laughs> Jared, part of it is Jared Dudley the dog. I, I, I don't I don't want to call sweet, anyone the young dog, puppy, but but, but <laughs> yeah. The sweet puppy uh, that our that our uh, wife gave us. Yeah. Um, but um, but I think there's also this like weird history of, you know, in order to uh, enter the NBA, uh, the Nets basically had to you know give up Dr. J, um, who then became a Sixers legend, right? I mean, so mm. so mm. there is that, and in and in John Wick there is that history, right? Because you know the russian mobsters that he's fighting are the people he used to work for like he kind of helped put them where they are um so and now he's back to you know basically kill them all yeah um so 
So yeah, so that, that, that's why I thought Sixers. I really should have gone before you, Bill, because yours is so much better. That's that's a t- <laughs> that's the, that connected on so many levels, and plus also mine is the first repeat, which is this is the one where I went the Revenant. I, I struggled. I struggled with this one quite a bit because it was one of the few that we actually have a recent past with, like we're saying the series. And so for that reason, I was like, well, we got like mauled in that in the way that we get mauled <laughs> by a bear, but like he's not really trying to exact revenge on the bear. The bear is just an agent of chaos from the <laughs> revenge. So I struggled, um, but ultimately, I guess I went just for the for the recency of the of the attack, the bear attack. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, went, I went for I went for that route, um, but yeah, that's where I went. Um, next one up I have on my list is the Milwaukee Bucks. Uh, Bilga, we'll start with you. What was your Milwaukee Bucks revenge movie killer comparison? I, I, I struggled to come up with a, a, a really good one for this one, but, but the, the one I settled actually on, um, return of the Jedi, which one doesn't think <laughs> of as a re- revenge movie, except that you know, it was originally called Revenge of the Jedi, so presumably it was supposed <laughs> to be a revenge movie. Mm. Um, but um, I, I thought of that mainly because the the Bucks for the last several years have been so uh, seemingly dominant, um, and they feel like they've always felt like the one team that just we were just never going to beat. And we'll see how, what happens in the in the playoffs. I mean, you know, it's going to be a tough series, uh, but. Um, you know, because Giannis was so dominant. I mean, the last two years, uh, you know, you always, I always got the sense that the, the Nets, the 2018, 2019, and 2019, 2020 Nets, um, sort of had it in them to to be able to basically play any team, even though they obviously lost a lot of games. Um, but the Bucks were the one, every time I saw them on the schedule, I was like, well, that's a scheduled loss. We're just going to get completely destroyed. Mm. Um, even though, you know, they did actually manage to win a couple of those games. Um, so I thought of the Bucks as like basically the Empire, <laughs> the, yeah. the Empire, and yet also kind of like the also like the Empire in that you know once the playoffs started they turned out to have a bit of a glass jaw. Uh, although this year they don't seem to have that, but um, but in the past they have you know they have been this Death Star, uh, but um, but also there's like a, a thing right in the center of it that you can access. <laughs> You can just yeah. like destroy it, <laughs> the, Brian. What do you um, like to call it? The, the anal canal of the of the death. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> that's, that's the right. Stand, yeah, you know. Um, yeah, and, and if, yeah. if you link it, Brooke Lopez, huge Star Wars fan, right? Makes a lot. I mean, it makes a lot of sense. Um, <laughs> so, if the Nets are the Rebels, who's Luke? Who's Han? And who's Leia? Yeah. Well, the whole team, I mean, the whole thing can be summarized by Luke as in just like he comes in a little bit retooled, right? I mean, basically, I, like, I stole yours after I saw you in the, when you DM'd us. I was like, that's actually the best version of the Bucks. I had some like placeholder gladiator there and I was like, this is this is not going to cut it. But I totally agree because especially because Luke comes back with a little bit more bag or tricks in his bag. Um, right, right. You know, that's the whole deal. Yeah. And Giannis is like Darth Vader, I guess. Yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah. Seems like a terrible thing to say about Giannis. Who Booted Holzer like a, is the emperor. emperor. He looks good. Yeah, this is, yeah physically. And Giannis will eventually yeah. throw Booten Holzer into. Wow, the chasm. The yeah. chasm. And then yeah. Booten Holzer will come back, you know, 15 years from now or however long ago. What was episode nine? It's a quick episode? turnaround. It's, yeah, 15 years max, I would say. <laughs> I, I, I can't remember yeah. if somebody pointed out. I haven't. I've only watched Return uh, or Re- the you know the last one. What the hell was it called? Rise of Skywalker. Uh, um, I, was, I was like, what is that movie called? I think of it as uh, Nine now because it's so. I right. wanted to kind of separate it from my brain as much as I could. I, I, I think I only saw it once, uh, but I think somebody pointed out that everything in that movie, like. Palpatine's return basically happens over the course of like two days, <laughs> so it's like ultimately a minor news story in the in the Star Wars universe. Yeah, um, everything they literally just hop a few planets and like he's back and then he's dead, right? Yeah. He's dead again. Um, I had so I went off book and you know uh, the creators' rights here. Um, I did not go with a revenge movie because you know the Bucks and ultimately one of the central players who we've already talked about, Brooke Lopez. There's no revenge the Nets could have for Brook Lopez. So what I compared it to of all the uh, of the great vast library of films that America has produced, uh, La La Land. And I say it's like La La Land. I specifically Brook Lopez 
is Ryan Gosling and Emma Stone are the Nets. Uh, and I mean that because if you remember in La La Land, uh, they, ha- they, they broke up. They had to break up, right? And then we get to see they break up and then they both achieve a certain level of success. Emma Stone becomes this international movie star. Ryan Gosling finally owns the jazz club that he had been so wanting to own for so very, very long. Uh, the Nets become this this juggernaut by trading Brooke Lopez. That was really, of course, you know, getting Sean Marks around the team, Kenny Atkinson to coach the team. Those are important moments. Trading Brooke for D'Lo is what put the Nets on the trajectory to becoming the juggernaut that they are. And Ryan Gosling is like Brooke Lopez because Ryan Gosling, I mean, he breaks up with someone who ends up being, I'm guessing is like the Julia Roberts of the La La Land world. Like if we're, that's a reality, the La La Land reality, um, that's who I'm assuming playing. Ryan Gosling then just like becomes like this nice role player in the fabric of Los Angeles. Um, and Brooke went from going to the Lakers, having a bad year with the Lakers, kind of was like floating of like, how much longer is Brooke Lopez going to play basketball? to becoming an extremely important role player on a team that you compare to the Death Star in the Empire. So they are, to me, Emma Stone and Ryan Gosling in La La Land. They had to break up to both achieve the level of success that they're in. And I'm getting to look at my list, and pretty much Emma Stone's yeah, on every one Yeah, I was going to say, are so you working through her, her discography here? The <laughs> <laughs> Meticulously. Wow. Um, next one up, we're going to go Nick's. We ready to do Knicks? I'm ready. Brian, do you have a Knicks or do you want? I do. It's a it's a quick and easy one too. Um, so for Knicks, I went with the scene in Office Space where they beat up the printer, where they like attack the printer. Because <laughs> like for me, the Knicks don't pose a real <laughs> viable threat, and so the revenge here is mostly against something that's passive and and symbolic, uh, a nuisance, right? Um, and and so we're never gonna play them. We're not gonna do it. But they still like exist. This like. This croaking, obnoxious, you know, old piece of technology that needs to go away, and <laughs> and when we, and if and when we actually do play them, I feel very confident that it would be like smashing a printer with a bat. Um, so for that reason, I went with the Office Space <laughs> printer <laughs> printer scene. Love it. Yeah, I love it. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Bill, go. Um, well, um, the. the I have a two-part answer to this one nice. uh, because if I if I were a, a, a rational, uh, sober-minded human being, and was able to look at this situation objectively, I would probably say this is kind of like Batman versus Superman, mm. um, which actually is a is a revenge movie because it's basically about Batman uh, trying to you know take revenge on Superman, um, in part because um, because of like you know. Batman has Gotham and Superman has Metropolis. And originally, uh, you know, both those cities were basically stand-ins for New York. Uh, But because of, you know, corporate demands and the need to put them in the same universe, Mm -hmm. now they're like two separate cities that are like across the water from each other. This is great, yeah. Um, So, uh, you know, and and look, for many years, I mean, look, Brooklyn is is New York, uh, but for the purposes of, of, you know, um, the NBA, uh, it, they are now two different cities that are, that are like intense rivals with each other. Um, and also because, you know, the Knicks and the Nets are ultimately kind of probably on the same team in some weird way and, and are being made to fight each Mm. other, uh, because that spectacle is, is exciting and interesting to people. But of course, as someone who hates the, the Knicks, um, it's very hard for me to actually, make this argument in it sincerely. Um, so I'm going to go with Heathers <laughs> <laughs> yes. because, yeah. you know, the, the Knicks to me seem uh, very entitled and, and empty and, and undeserving of their status. Mm. Uh, and, and we are willing to uh, make a deal with the literal devil to destroy them. Wow. I love that. <laughs> The Superman, well, in this case, actually, so it was Metropolis. I mean, you'd have to say Manhattan is Metropolis in that mm-hmm. in that example, which makes us Batman, which I would yeah. take, which I take any day, honestly. That's what. That's oh, yeah. The, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Those Absolutely. are great. Um, I have. This is a little too on the nose, so like, oh. I'm not even going to try to. Gangs of New York, uh, very on the but, nose. But even though, the, again, another Leo DiCaprio movie, and I'm Daniel Day Lewis is going to make a reappearance later in my list. 
um, you know, it's a revenge. It's a classic revenge movie. His father was killed, Leo's father, and he comes back and he changes his name. And the Nets, in a way, their name has been changed from the New Jersey Nets to the Brooklyn Nets. Mm -hmm. They're New York teams. Uh, and even like the the Knicks kind of have the Billy, like what's it, Billy the Butcher? Is that? Bill. Bill the Butcher. Bill the Butcher. Bill, Bill yeah. the Butcher. Kind of have that energy. They have that energy a little bit. Like, sure, sure. They're, they are the entrenched power uh, in the city. They don't want to give up their power uh, that they have. And the Nets are this ragtag group of dead rabbits uh, <laughs> and uh, want to sort of become, want to overtake the entrenched power that Daniel Day-Lewis and his glass eye mm. have. Uh, so gangs of New York. Basic. But it felt, felt like that fit. Nice. Enough. nice. Um, Los Angeles Lakers. Bilga, you start off. Lakers, um, I'm going to go with the Count of Monte Cristo uh, for this Ooh. one. Um, and, and, and you know, obviously there have been a, a ver variety of versions of Count of Monte Cristo, but I think for our purposes, probably the, the 2002 movie makes the most sense. Um, 2002 also happens to be the year the, uh, the Lakers defeated, swept the Nets in the, mm. the NBA Finals. Um, and so, you know... All these, all you know, because the thing about Count of Monte Cristo is about a guy who just spends years plotting his revenge while the rest of the world just, you know, forgets he exists. Mm. Um, so that is, and and basically gets really good at everything. He becomes like a, a genius um, and learns everything about the world, and um, basically kind of just, uh, you know, turns into almost a superhero to try and get back, and. Um, I don't know. I can't. I can't remember if the novel has this, but the movie has. I think the, the bad guy marries uh, the hero's fiance, yeah. uh, and who in this case is Jason Kidd, <laughs> um, <laughs> who, who, who who led us to the finals, but is now sitting, uh, you know, helpless uh, damsel uh, <laughs> as a as an assistant yeah. coach for the <laughs> for the Lakers, um, and is probably. You know, just counting the days until he can get out of there. Yeah, I, I mean, to me, anytime it kind of Monte Cristo, I was so excited to put it on the list because <laughs> it's such a rich movie and like it's it's both like incredibly goofy, old fashioned, but yeah, I love it. Like I love, I just love. I mean, I could lie if there was like a three year cycle of a Count of Monte Cristo, as if it was the Olympics. If there's every four years we had a Count of Monte Cristo, I would be excited by that prospect. You know, what's so interesting is so while you were explaining that like rationalization, it's very similar to the rationalization that I had for my movie, which was Cape fear to the point where I almost think there's like a midterm essay out there for some, for some film student, you know, for comparing <laughs> Monte Cristo and Monte Cristo to Cape fear. Cause basically it's the same idea, right? Max Katie has this, you know, all the time to he's, he's, you know, sent him to prison and becomes kind of a super genius slash super monster. Um, that comes back to, <clears throat> to right the wrongs that he feels um, were, were dealt to him. Um, so yeah, basically the exact same premise, but just swapping out um, a Cajun accented, or I don't even know, where is that accent from? Uh, Robert, De Robert De Niro. Um, I have There Will Be Blood oh, wow. for oh. Lakers Nets. That's a revenge um, movie, huh? Interesting. It, it becomes a, re I mean, it's not, right, it's not purely, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's about capitalism and all what up but uh it does become one in the end obviously when he when daniel day lewis bashes paul dano's head with a with a bowling pin yeah um it's pretty uh <laughs> that's that's a rough ending so the and it, you know there's a lot that that goes into it i don't i couldn't figure out who like which team was who and who which team do, would you want like would you rather be daniel day lewis or would you rather be paul dano you know what I mean? In, like in that scene, it, well, yeah. no, <laughs> just as light in life. Like, would you rather be this rich person, but who's an alcoholic, has no friends, lives by himself in his mansion, or I guess would you rather be Paul Dano, who was like comes this like religious figure, but also ends up penniless, and you know, like it's not like a great. There's no winners, and there will be blood. Yeah. It's all losers. Um, but you know, California. It's it's based in California, nice. and and they're they're both trying to attain the same thing. Not oil. They're trying to get power. Both the Nets and the Lakers are trying to be these like 
they're trying to be super teams. The Lakers are. They are already the preeminent franchise in the NBA. The Nets are trying to be that. The Nets aren't trying to beat the Knicks. They're trying to actually beat the Lakers and people like that to become the team that if you're a star, you just want to go to the Nets. And the Lakers are that team right now. Um, can the Nets dr get all the oil out of the land around the ranch that Paul Dano is protecting or whatever mm -hmm. he's doing? That's what they're trying to do as we speak. Well, and maybe so. that's what the smoothies are. They're yeah. not actually smoothies. They're milkshakes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and we are drinking. And, and we drink them we up. We're drinking the milkshake. Drink <laughs> drainage. Um, drainage. God. And just like reading, so. like, the, just even reading the Wikipedia description of the movie, which, like, it, it wanted, like, so you're like, what the hell is this movie when you're reading it? But, like, you just begin to think about the scenes in that movie and the lines, and you're like, oh, my. That 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 movie just gets better. Yeah, it's the opposite oh, yeah. of the Revenant. The, the titling of that movie does a pretty big disservice, I think, to how how little blood there is ultimately inside. It's just a little bit, just on a one on just one a tiny bit bowling of pin. Yeah, but the I'm calling a movie a tiny bit of blood. Yeah, <laughs> there's doesn't sell. There'll be a little bit, just a little bit, just yeah. a little bit of a yeah. little bit of blood. All right, so the next one I, I thought was very hard, uh, and I think Bilgo, you're the only one that actually accomplished this task. The Atlanta Hawks. Um, I, so honestly, there's no, I have no uh, animosity towards the Atlanta Hawks. They've been as irrelevant as the Nets have been. Um, Trey Young, I'm actually gleeful of the way Trey Young's been uh, acting in the Knicks series. I like how the, the Hawks going into the series were acting like everyone was saying, oh, the Knicks are so tough. And the Hawks have actually shown to be the mentally tougher team. Um, I've enjoyed all that. So I have no. <laughs> No animosity towards the Atlanta Hawks, but what did you come up with? Well, I, I was kind of in the same boat. Um, so I, I went with, actually, um, I went with Clint Eastwood's Unforgiven, mm. Um, mm. which is, you know, which is kind of a revenge movie. Um, but but it's interesting because, and, you know, Clint Eastwood made a lot of movies that were revenge movies, like much, much kind of clearer revenge movies over the course of his career. But then, by the time it came to Unforgiven, I think he really wanted to just like interrogate the myth of the Western and 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 his own iconography. Um, so you know the the film is you know for much of the film you're watching Gene Hackman, you know who is the ostensible villain of the film, but he's not really doing anything villainous. I mean you you're, you 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 know he's the sheriff of this town trying to keep things you know under control and and at times failing to, um, and he becomes kind of a villain at the end, but. But that was kind of the situation I find myself with. The, like right now, I am rooting for the Hawks yeah. to, to beat the Knicks <laughs> pretty fiercely. Um, and I mean, it looks like they probably will, in which case I will be rooting even more fiercely for them to beat the Sixers. Um, and so I'm going to have like basically a three or four week period where I was pretty consistently rooting for the Hawks. And if by some you know, by some happenstance, they do wind up facing off against the Nets. That's going to be a pretty shocking reversal for me. And so, so the idea that, and then if we do, you know, if we do dispatch the Hawks, if it does happen, um, you know, it won't be revenge. It'll be, you know, it's just business. This is kind of, you know, deserves got nothing to do with it. Right. Um, right. Yeah. Um, and even though by the end of by the end of Unforgiven, uh, Clint Eastwood's character is pretty much completely just drowning in vengeance. But um, but I kind of like the idea of watching a movie where where the ostensible bad guy uh, is for much of the film not that bad a guy. Um, by I mean by the standards of like a, a western movie. Um, so anyway, that that that's 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 what I went with. But there was also there's also a little part of me that's you know if I were a Hawks fan, I would I would maybe think of. Carlito's way a little bit which isn't mm -hmm. a revenge movie but it, it's got that um you know Al Pacino plays this this um ex-con uh mobster who come kind of comes back um comes back to to uh to New York and then uh John Leguizamo plays this young up-and-comer named Benny Blanco from the Bronx who <laughs> tries to be friends with him early on and is you know basically dismissed and ignored and then right at the end of the movie uh comes back and kills him mm. um, and uh and so i thought there's a little bit of benny blanco from the bronx in uh trey young too um also because he's i think like he idolizes steve nash 
um, and would probably want love nothing more than to do away with Steve Nash's team. Yeah, <laughs> in the playoffs. That's that's so good. There's so many like because I, I was trying to think about this one too, and there's so many parallels for like mob stuff because there's this like yeah. friendship slash business like as, as you say deserves right. got nothing to do with it. And for that reason, I was like thinking about like Donnie Brasco, but it didn't quite fit mm-hmm. because in that case, I would say you know we're more of the. Uh, Pacino character, so because as just, just like the older figurehead, but maybe not. I don't know. It's hard to say. Hard to say. I couldn't figure it out. But I think I think Unforgiven is like the best of the bunch. That's a great one. Yeah. So to get, go with the mob one, and I'll just move to the Clippers. So I had the Godfather for that one. Uh, interesting. Wow. And, and I think we all went mob. Very simply, that and, and that's a, that's also like when I was talking about like what's a, it's a weird to think of the Godfather as a revenge movie because it obviously revenge is had and it's an important. It's extremely important part of the plot, but and to me, like it ascends revenge because the scope and what you're trying to, th- what the movie is trying to do in a lot of different levels, it's not as simple as like John Wick, where a puppy is killed, right? <laughs> While John Wick is a better movie than The Godfather, I think we all know that. <laughs> um, it 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 the Godfather, I'd never thought of it as a, it's like is Die Hard a Christmas movie. I don't think of The Godfather as a revenge movie because you so thoroughly understand why Michael is doing what he is doing, right? Like, it, it almost doesn't feel like revenge. It it feels like biz- it's business, right? Whatever. Um, but I say it's the Clippers and Nets. Mm. They're both these upstart guerrilla organizations trying to hold power. And it's like the warring families that are in The Godfather. And if we're even go further... Lawrence Frank is Tessio. You know, he's the traitor. He's the guy who's flipped. <laughs> you know, Lawrence Frank is now in a power position yeah. at the Clippers. Um, so I, I, it's because the tension of Godfather, I mean, ultimately it's criminals against criminals, right? So it's not, it's not like there's a good person and then there's a bad person. It's just that we get the perspective of one of the good people, of or not one of the good people, one of the bad people. That's what side we're on. Um, not that the Clippers and Nets are bad, but they're both trying to gain stars to beat the Knicks or the Lakers in the Clippers situation, overtake them as the power. And by doing that, they're getting these this influx of of uh, manpower in some way. Uh, so I go the Godfather, Clippers, Nets. Bill, what do you got? I, I, I like that. I, I like that comparison. Um, I, I went with Face Off. Because, um, I love that. because we're basically the same teams, right? I mean, we're not. Well, obviously, they're, they're, you know, very different in many ways. But, you know, the the journey um, and kind of the status is is very similar. It's you know the 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 younger sibling team in the big city um, that's that that was scrappy, and we kind of had. I mean, the 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 2019 playoffs was similar in that the the, the Clippers. Um, you know the, the the Clippers were kind of a surprise uh, team during the first round of the playoffs, and and the Nets were as well. You know, at least for for about a day. <laughs> um, but um, but then you know, and they were both kind of seen as these these scrappy uh, underdog teams that were you know punching above their weight, um, and were both kind of led by you know sixth man of the year type candidates. Um, in you know, um, and uh, so. And face off, even though I mean, there's obviously a good guy and a <laughs> bad guy in face off. I, I love the fact that it's, really, it's just like you know, John Travolta and Nicolas Cage changing trading faces. Mm. Um, so they're it's kind of like you, sometimes you don't know who you're really rooting for, and and you know, one is pretending to be the other, um, and it's just this like you know, delirious um, sense of like you're rooting. I mean, one of the things I love about that movie is, um, uh, you know, the, the, the spectacle of uh, John Travolta trying to act like Nicolas Cage. Um, or or uh, look like him in the body. That's my, that's my favorite suspension yeah. of disbelief is that, like, I don't know, does Nick Cage have, like, five inches on John Travolta and, like, minus, <laughs> I don't know, 60 pounds? You know, different bodies. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, what would be like the two actors today or two actresses that you would like to see try to emulate oh, wow. each other? Like, I know this is a tough one. There's like the female lead like, reboot of that is a thing that should happen. 
for sure. And lean like, in and lean into that with two very different body types too. Like that's it could be a comedy. Like we could go Clint with comedy, Eastwood yeah. as Jim Carrey, right? Because I know Jim Carrey <laughs> could do Clint Eastwood, but can Clint Eastwood do a Jim Carrey approximate? Like something like oh, yeah. you have to you want to go as far away from each other as possible. Um, I don't think anyone would see Face Off Two. Jim Carrey. Actually, a lot of people would probably see. I, I, I would, Face off. I would Come watch on. that movie a hundred times. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Off, yeah. I would watch it today. I know they are making. Aren't they making a sequel to Face Off or, or what? some breaking news? There's, there's supposed re- to be some kind of Face Ducks? Off. I'll look it up. Um, yeah. yeah, either like a. a I want to say is it a TV show or. I don't know. If it's a um, TV, how do you keep facing? How do you keep facing off? You know. Uh, yeah, it wasn't. It was big news like a, a year ago, a year and a half ago. It's uh, coming out. We get action it. sequel coming out. Doesn't have wow. a date. Who's who's attached? Just just as of right now, I just see the writer. Just write it. I'm just talking about it. It's like <laughs> that's not a good sign. <clears throat> great great names I'll... though. Caster Troy. You know, come on. Really, <laughs> really, <laughs> really fantastic. Yeah, illustrative. All right, so. I don't think Brian, you don't have anyone for jazz nuggets. I, right? I pretty no. much don't have anyone from here on out. That's 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 where I dropped off. All right, so Bill, it's it's your show. You 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 drive the plane. Jazz nuggets. Who who do you have for each of those teams? Um, I mean these are these are tough, obviously, because you know they're not teams we have like huge rivalries with. Uh, for for jazz, I thought of the movie My Bodyguard, which. <laughs> Um, so good. I don't know if you guys uh, ever saw. It was a big deal when I was a kid. I watched it as a kid a lot. Yeah, my okay. for whatever reason, my dad like kept renting this for me. I don't know this movie, so yeah. tell me. Uh, I mean, what is it about? Is it about well, a bodyguard? But Brian might is it actually the Sinbad remember. Sinbad movie. What's that? No, it's uh, well. No. Also, my sisters were like big into Matt Dillon. That was like right. a big yeah. part of my childhood. Yeah. Uh, Brian <laughs> might Dillon. actually remember uh, the, the the plot of this movie better than I would because I, I think it has literally been like thirty five years since I've seen it. But um, I would struggle. But I, it's you know it's it's a I mean no I can't do it I can't really summarize it. Yeah. The, 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 you know and so much of my you know I mean my, my conception of this movie is basically from my vague memory of it, which I'm sure is incorrect, but it's. You know, it's about a, a, a young kid who's being bullied um, at school by by a, a very young Matt Dillon, uh, who just who just when you were a kid watching that movie, he just seemed positively satanic. Mm, mm. Um, and then he tries to enlist this bigger uh, kid to basically be his bodyguard. Um, and and, it, it, you know, it in the grand scheme of things and, and through the uh, the retrospective gaze of adulthood, I can now probably see that movie as being um, a cautionary tale about having like other people fight your battles for you and how like, uh, you know, an yeah. eye for an eye will make the whole world blind or whatever. But um, but in, in, in my conception of this, you know, I mean, I only beef with the jazz is just the 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 the, the last regular season game that we played with them where uh the the big three were out and uh and i think you know most of the starters sat and poor alizé johnson who i think was it was maybe his first game as a net um you know was out there uh and they just got absolutely uh destroyed and now presumably if we wind up facing off against them It'll be, uh, you know, I'd like to introduce you to my bodyguards, uh, <laughs> Kevin Durant, James Harden, and Kyrie Irving. Uh, so we we brought in reinforcements. Um, so so yeah, that that's that's what I had for the Jazz, and then um, for the Nuggets. Uh, you know, I like the Nuggets. I actually, uh, you know, I always kind of low key root for the Nuggets. Um, so I don't have a, a, any kind of big beefs with them, but. I do. Uh, the one I picked for that was Uncle Drew because mm. Uncle Drew is actually a revenge movie, and um, wow. and also you know they have Aaron. Some Gordon. say the best revenge movie. Yeah. Some do. Some yeah. say I've it. heard it. Yeah. yeah. Um, and and you know they've got Aaron Gordon, um, who who you know who was like the the bat one of one of the bad guys in Uncle Drew, even though he's not actually doing anything. <laughs> he is in no way the, the dominant uh, superpower that uh, he was advertised as being. Um, so I don't know. I, I thought, you know, good to get Uncle Drew in there. Um, got it. Got it. Yeah. Perfect. Awesome. I was thinking also just yeah. generally of like, you know, players as as revenge characters. And I just wanted to insert that like Kyrie Irving could be like a V for Vendetta guy <laughs> with his sort of sociopolitical views. <laughs> and the fact that he almost certainly owns a Guy Fox mask. Almost certainly. I'm, I'm positive. Yeah. Um, well, this was a pure delight. Um, before we go, Bilgo, your favorite 
not the best, but what what is your favorite revenge movie? Is there something that comes to mind that you think you know? And I'm not going to hold you to it, you know. I'm not, mm. But what what comes to mind is one of your favorite ones to watch. Gosh, that's a that's a that's a good question. And um, there's probably some movie that I'm like totally forgetting that's like in my top ten of all time or whatever. I mean, Old like Boy is is obviously yeah. fantastic. Old Boy um, was on the list. It was on the list. I was going to use it for the Heat, uh, but they didn't they didn't survive. But I was thinking Old Boy for Heat kind of because it's like a vague, I'm like kind of a targetless revenge story, you know, uh, for for the vast majority. And that's sort of how I feel about the Heat. Like it's like Jimmy. I don't have anything necessarily against Jimmy, but we haven't faced Jimmy Butler. But like I, I, I do feel passionately that I want to get revenge on him for some reason. You know, can't place it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, also because it's, uh, you know, it's a revenge movie. Uh, but then it turns out that the the actual revenge being enacted is is on the protagonist. Um, right. Which is, and it's, you know, it's obviously an incredibly disturbing twist that we don't need to get into. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, Old Boy is is one that came to mind. The other one I. Um, one of the other one I was thinking of, and it might be because I'm just like reading something about Brando right now, but uh, One Eye Jacks, the Marlon Brando western, mm, no, um, I don't know that one. which is which is which was not very well liked, I think, at the time that it came out. <laughs> you know, back in the fifties, early sixties, I think. Um, but is is one of my favorite westerns now. Um, you know, couldn't find anything to really compare it to that one. Um, but uh, but it's mm. about you know Brando is a, is, a, is an outlaw who's Whose whose mates um, leave him for dead, uh, and then he comes back and and enacts revenge on um, his, his his former partner, who's played by Carl Malden, who has now become, I think, the sheriff of a town. Um, I could be remembering wrong, but anyway, <laughs> I'm taking notes. I'm taking these notes. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, this was so much fun. I I'm so glad we did this with you. I'm so glad we got you on the pod. Um, I appreciate you listening to us as much as you do, um, and. Obviously, we're going to see this revenge play out. The Nets have gotten revenge. If, if this was uh, Scott Pilgrim, uh, the Nets have beaten uh, one of the ex-boyfriends, and they're going to keep marching their way towards Jason Schwartzman, right? He's the final boss. Never seen um, it. I know. I, I, gotta, I guess I got to. Oh, my God. It's yeah. so good. I think it's like out in theaters right now. Didn't they re-release it? <laughs> really? Wow. Interesting. I think it's literally out in theaters I go, right I go now. to see that. It's fantastic. All right. Well, thank you so much, Bilga. Thank, Thank you. you.